praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a good shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, that wasn't a good shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, give him some praise. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. Hallelujah. For all that you're going to do today. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Hallelujah. Everybody get some good sleep. Hallelujah. I did. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to flow. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. A uh, couple of things I want to share with you before I get into the message that I'm going to share with us today. Uh, first of all, a little bit of business. If you want to give an offering, uh, you should want to give an offering. Hallelujah. Uh, the baskets are up here still as the word of God goes forth. You know, I found the best place of fruitfulness in your offering is while the preach is going forth. Because you're getting something from the word and that as the word's being spoken to you, you're giving, hallelujah, amen, and it brings a greater return. Could I get a good amen, hallelujah, amen. And uh, so as the Lord speaks to you, ministers to you, and, and prompts your heart to give, uh, you have the little bulletin still, you could give Cash App, you could give uh, uh, Zelle, and you could give PayPal, uh, whichever way, or you could fill out the envelope. Uh, it's easier for us if you give one of those three ways that's inside that paperwork. You don't have to do it right now, but sometime through the day if you would give that offering. Hallelujah. A little, something that's been on my heart that I want to share that I don't think we give enough attention to. And uh, we've been talking a lot about the fivefold ministry gifts, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Uh, we believe in it. Uh, but one of the things that I think that the church needs to come back to having faith in, and that's the local church. Amen. Could I get a good amen? Hallelujah. I am tired of people saying we don't have to go to church. We are the church. Uh, let me tell you, if you are the church, then you're going to operate according to the church pattern that Jesus gave us. Hallelujah. Amen. And stick to the pattern of Christ. Hallelujah. And uh, I really believe that accountability is at the local house. Amen. So even as a minister, you should always be sent, not just went. Hallelujah. Amen. And there needs to be an accountability. Somebody say accountability. Yes. The other thing I think is that we haven't understood a lot is because uh, a lot of people saying they're uh, uh, an apostle prophet movement. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's some that are called just to operate in that function. Uh, that's what God gave them to do. But one of the things love and unity is, it's not just an apostle prophet movement. It's a whole fivefold ministry movement. Hallelujah. Amen. Could I get a Shandai or a Hikamo? Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We are full fivefold, but listen to me. But we are an apostolic people. Now, when I say apostolic people, it doesn't mean we are an apostle people. Apostles only part of it. Being apostolic people, you need all five. Because the word apostolic means sent ones. Amen. We are the sent ones of God. And you and I are called to be an apostolic people, sent ones to advance the kingdom of God in the earth. Could I get a good amen? Hallelujah. Amen. And that's what love and unity is about. It's about creating a corporate people that will come together to represent the pattern that Christ laid out for us as his church. And through his local church, we are creating, discipling sons, men and women of God into being an apostolic sent people of God to bring forth the glory of God in all the earth. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's our mission. That's what we're called to do. That's why we're working with fivefold ministry gifts so much because if the fivefold ministry gifts don't get that, then the people will never get that. So we are the ecclesia, ecclesia, whichever way you want to call it or both. We are an apostolic people. We are a kingdom people. But there's something that's more important that you get a hold of. If you don't get a hold of it, you won't be effective in all that. You are sons of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And you have to grab a hold of your identity. Our fellowships need to grab a hold of their sonship identity. Because if you don't have a sonship identity, you have an orphan mentality. 
And I know people get mad when I say that. And just to explain, I'm not talking about orphans in the world. We love the orphans. We take care of the orphans. I'm talking about an orphan mentality. That means you're still living by the first Adam and not by the second Adam. You haven't come into the fullness of being sons of God that have been set free by the power of God to represent his kingdom here on the earth. We are all sons of God. How many sons of God do we have here today? Hallelujah. Amen. Aren't you glad you're a son? That you could be in the midst of darkness, but because you're a son, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. Amen. And you have the identity of who you really are, what Christ has really made you. But love and unity has been called by God to advance his kingdom by raising up an apostolic people by recognizing all five-fold ministry offices, functions, whatever you want to call them. I don't care if you call them titles or non-titles. I'm not focused on the title. I'm focused on the function and the office. Hallelujah. You could call me Eddie. You could call me Ray. You could call me Doe. Hallelujah. I don't care. Hallelujah. Amen. But don't rebel against the, God, the gift that's on my life. That's what I want you to respect, the office. Mm -mm. Too much that's going on in the church is because we have shied away from accountability, submission, structure, order. And we do that because the world is calling it now manipulation, control. Huh? No, it's not manipulation or control. Otherwise, every parent is manipulating and controlling. Because as a parent, it's your responsibility to raise your children in the ways of the Lord. you got to give them structure. You have to give them accountability. You have to give them boundaries. Hallelujah. Well, how much more does God do that with us as the body of Christ? Hallelujah. We need boundaries. We need accountability. We need structure to be able to do all that God's called us to do. So God has raised up love and unity to be an apostolic sent ones of God to advance his kingdom as sons of God with operating in the full fivefold ministry gifts, hallelujah, so we are fully equipping the body of Christ to be who God's called them to be so we can go from city to city, from region to region, hallelujah, tear down the strongholds over cities and regions, praise God, and see God's glory fill the earth, hallelujah, amen. How many are ready to see the glory of God fill the earth, hallelujah, fill New Jersey, fill every part of but the way it's going to be done is not by one ministry, not by one man, not by one person. It's going to be when we become the corporate body of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. And we join together, lock arms together with no competition, no jealousy, no envy with one another, no covetous glory to God, but all recognizing one another as an important part of the body of Christ. That we prefer one another better than ourselves. We love one another. When God began to speak to me about doing all these things, I said, God, how's this going to be done? He says, by love. By love. Until the body of Christ understands that God is love. And they that loveth not knoweth not God. It all starts with love. Love is the most powerful force of God in the earth today. Love doesn't fail. Love overcomes all adversity. Love gets us through every trial, every stronghold, every bondage, everything that we ever face in life. If you stick to love, you'll overcome every single bit of it. Hallelujah. Because love doesn't fail. It always wins. And if we would seek his kingdom in a way that we are first putting him and putting who he is. He is the God of love. And if we're going to be that apostolic people that he's called to be, the first thing we need to be is love. Is love. So just look at somebody and say, he's not preaching yet, hallelujah, amen. Uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm laying a foundation of what the love and unity movement is about. Because we hear so many things, well, we hear you're an apostle-type an apostle ministry. No. Why we hear that you are this and you are that. No. What you hear is not always true. 
We believe in all fivefold. We love the pastors. We love the teachers. We love the evangelists. We love the prophets and we love the apostles. And not one of them is more important than the other. They're just all different than one another. They have different graces, but they're all important. Say that with me. They're all important. Hallelujah. My Lord, do we need some good Holy Ghost pastors today. Hallelujah. But that will embrace the kingdom, that will embrace the apostles, the prophets as well. We've had too long one man shows, one man pastor, one man apostle, one man prophet. They all say they're the way. No, Jesus is the way. And in all five fold is Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Because he's all five. And when those five are functioning and operating together, we'll see the full counsel of God in operation functioning in the body of Christ the way it's supposed to. Amen. That's just my, uh, I'll say it's administrative work. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I get a good amen? amen. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to teach to you today or preach, like Michael says, I teach, preach. Hallelujah. Uh, how many like Michael's preaching last night? Wasn't that good? Hallelujah. I tell you, he set it up for us, praise God, in a good way so we could be able to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish to this meeting. But if you want a title, what I'm going to share today, I'm going to talk about the manifested glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. We need to see the glory of God operate in the body of Christ more than ever before. If you want to see people get delivered and set free, we need his glory flowing in the church. Hallelujah. Amen. Not just a religious glory, not just a man's glory, but the Shekinah glory. Hallelujah. Amen. The glory that when that glory hits, demons tremble. Darkness leaves. People are free. People change. People are transformed. We have a lot of preaching, a lot of teaching, but very low manifestation. I'm preaching uh, uh, preachers today, hallelujah. What do you always tell your people? Say amen, hallelujah, amen. Uh, (laughs) I'm just going to start off by reading Psalms 133, verse 1 to 3. The manifested glory comes when people find their purpose, operate by the pattern, then there's a manifestation of power and glory. Your purpose is your assignment. And many people don't want to operate in their assignment, they want to operate what God's assigned to somebody else. And we need to come into the assignment and the purpose that God has given every single one of us. But you'll never find that until you first find your identity in Christ. Then you find your purpose in Christ, what God's called you to do. Then pattern. There's a complete pattern in Scripture of how we're supposed to operate as sons, as the ecclesia, As an apostolic people, there's pattern that we are to operate and function. And the reason why the church is in such a mess today, because it it got away from the pattern. And we started operating to please people. We started operating to run, uh, uh, to please men behind the pulpit instead of running things that will benefit all the people of God. Hallelujah. And there's a pattern that God gives us for that. When the purpose is right and the pattern is right, the manifestation will operate. It will function. It will flow. Power will go forth. People will get free. People will change. People will come into their identity. People will find their purpose, their destiny. They'll find their assignments. And we'll be able to to anoint them and lay hands on them and send them into the places they're assigned to. We've had church for long times. I've been doing the church thing for 45 years and seen systems and patterns and operations and functions 
totally opposite of the pattern that God gave us. So if we get back to pattern, we'll get back to glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, we'll see the glory of God begin to manifest and begin to operate. Now, there's ex expository preaching and there's topic, topical preaching. And Michael did more of the expository where he'll take the context or take the chapter, break it down and get the exegesis out of it, get the true definition and meaning out of what? Everybody say X. <laughs> topical, I'll get a topic that God gives me and I'll find scriptures to support that topic and bring it forth so that we squeeze the truth out of it. Hallelujah. Amen. But we're all after the truth. Somebody say, I'm after the truth. Hallelujah. Because it's only the truth that does what? Sets us free. Hallelujah. Now, a lot of men get scripture and put their own opinion in it. This is what I think it means. No, the scripture is completely capable of interpreting itself, hallelujah, amen. amen, and bringing the truth out of it so that we find the true pattern and the true example and the true testimony of the scriptures so we can live it and operate by it in the earth, hallelujah. Psalms 133, one says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard and even Aaron's beard and went down to the skirts and of his garments as the dew of Hermon and the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded blessings. Somebody say commanded. I don't know about you, but I want to come into the place where the anointing is touching every part of my life, hallelujah, and God is commanding blessings. Where the glory is at, where the anointing is at, the blessings are at, hallelujah, amen. But if you're not flowing in the anointing, if you're not flowing in the order of God, because Psalms 133 really is talking about the order of God from the head all the way down to the garments. And when everything is flowing in order, there's an anointing that not only touches the man of God that's up there in the front, but it touches every single person in the body, hallelujah. And every family begins to see commanded blessings come upon their family, upon their children, upon their finances, upon their health. Why? Because they come into the pattern. Amen. They come into the pattern, and because they're in the pattern, there's a glory that is manifested. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get out of the pattern. Amen. I don't want to get out of doing things my way. What I think is right, putting my own opinion on things. I've done that for many years. Guess what? It doesn't work. <laughs> and it fails and it causes more problems for our life. And then we got to dig ourselves out of holes and, and then we got to switch everything and admit we, we did that the wrong way. Why not just get it right? Hallelujah. Amen. And do it God's way, praise God. And the fastest way to do it God's way is coming together as the body of Christ because what I didn't know by myself, I now know because I have Michael, because I have Don, because I have Jack, hallelujah, and because they shared me their part, now I can get the full pattern and not just part of the pattern, glory to God, so I can operate in the unction and the function and the anointing and the manifestation of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, amen. Why? Because I'm operating by the full pattern, not a partial pattern. Because it's not just a pattern, but it's the full pattern. I share this story a lot of times. My mom got interested in sewing one time. She bought a sewing machine. And how many remember uh, uh, they, they give you patterns to make a shirt, to make a dress. And I used to tell my mom, Mom, make sure that whatever you're making me, it's not the dress. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, Make sure it's the shirt, hallelujah. So she went and made me a shirt, but she was learning, so she put part of the pattern in the wrong places. And my shirt came out kind of like this, hallelujah, amen. 
It was tight one area and loose another area. That's the way the body of Christ is. They're loose in some areas, too tight in some areas because they got the wrong pattern. And when we get to the right pattern, and the only way we're going to get to the right pattern is when we connect with one another as God has joined us together, hallelujah, to the head, which is Christ, all the way from the beard to the garments. And when we function together as the full pattern of Christ, then that's where the anointing is at, hallelujah, amen. And that's where God commands his blessings. Let me go this far to say, I can't be joined to where I want to be joined to. I got to be joined where God has ordained me to be joined to. <laughs> so people that are saying, well, I want to follow this group. I want, what is God telling you? Because <laughs> if I try to get this arm and connect it to my foot, I'm not going to look too good. This arm has to connect to the shoulder. The shoulder has to connect to this body. This body has to connect to the rest of it the right way. Otherwise, it can't function and operate the way it's supposed to. We have done so much wrong connections and for the wrong reasons. While they look popular, they look like they're growing and prospering Listen to me, because somebody's ministry is growing in process, it doesn't mean they're operating by the pattern. Matter of fact, my church is smaller than all the churches that I have today, but it's the most healthiest church I've ever had. We get more done now with my small group than I did when I had a thousand people. And I'm not going to get into the argument of having a big church, small church, all that stuff. I want to have the church God wants me to have, but I want it to be a healthy church. A discipleship church. Those that know their identity. I used to get a big church and only have 20, 25% of the people give. Now I have 75, 80% of the people that give. When we used to have functions, we'd have 10 or 15% of the people that operate. Now we have almost 100% of the people that get in there and operate when we're doing something. Why? Because we're creating disciples. It's more about quality than it is quantity. And we built churches out of quantity and not out of quality. We built it by filling the members up, uh, the seats up, not filling the members up. I should have got an amen out of that. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody say, amen. <laughs> we are shifting as the body of Christ from wrong patterns to the right pattern. We're shifting back into order. We're shifting back so that the anointing begin to fall from the head of Christ all the way down to his governments, all the way down to his body, all the way down to that brand new person that comes and sits, sits there in the church and gives their life to Jesus. The commanded blessings of God have to fall on everybody. If they're just falling on one person or just a few people, the pattern is wrong. Hallelujah. Amen. The pattern needs to fall on every single person. Why? Because the anointing, when it's in the right pattern, goes all the way through. Hallelujah. Amen. And the blessings cover every single person. So we got to find out our assignments. And we could talk about assignments and purposes and patterns and alignments in small ways and large ways and bigger ways because there's different things based on the assignments that God gives us of patterns that begin to come together to cause greater things to happen in the body of Christ. Somebody asked me one day, what do we have to do to get back to the pattern? I said, we got to get back to Christ. Well, everybody loves Jesus. Yeah, everybody loves Jesus. And Jesus loves me. Yes, I know, because the Bible tells me so. But is everybody living the pattern Christ? 
Is everybody walking in the pattern of Christ? Are we patterning our life after Christ's pattern? And everybody talks about the miracles that Jesus did. And oh, we want miracles to happen. And we want the power of God. And, and we, want, we want the glory of God to move. But they don't look at the other parts of the pattern. In Philippians 2, 5, it says, let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ. <laughs> Oh, we could just stop right there and have church. Hallelujah. Let this mind be in you, which is awesome. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Hallelujah. Amen. Man, I don't know about you, but since I've been a minister from the time that I got into ministry at 19 years of age, I've seen more focus on building leadership's reputation than building the people of God. If we are going to be Christ's pattern, if we are going to be like Christ, if we are going to manifest his glory and his power, we got to let this mind be in us as was in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And made himself with no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men. How much preaching and teaching do we hear about the heart of a servant? Leaders, ministers, the greatest desire of your heart, it should not be how good you can preach, how good you can get a clap, how good you can get people to stand and cheer your preaching, but how much do the people see that your heart is a heart to serve them? Let this mind be in you. Let this pattern that Christ had be the same pattern that you operate by. I have a servant's heart. Verse 8 says, and being found in a fashion as a man. Hey, here it is. Are you ready? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. I look at this one scripture here, and I said, my Lord, this is the key for the glory. This is the key for the anointing. This is the key for the power of God. It's humbleness and obedience. And when we take on the pattern and the likeness of Christ and begin to operate as he did, and we allow our minds to be the same as his, and we get transformed, matured into sonship, we come to a place of a servant's heart. We come to a place of humility. And when there's humility, there's obedience. And when there's obedience, there's the blessings. Hallelujah. Amen. Most people don't obey because they have not come to a place of humility, of a humble heart. One of the biggest problems in my life, because I'd have success because of my gifting in my office, and I could preach, and I could gather people, and I could do things. But I didn't have a right heart. I had a proud heart, not a humble heart. We keep talking about we want a move of God. We want God to move. We want God to change the church. We want God to change the cities, the communities. Okay, then let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself. Listen to me. Humble yourself or you will be humbled. Sometimes being humble is not a, a pretty process. Sometimes it's a painful process. Matter of fact, sometimes the obedience comes from the things that we suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody likes to talk about suffering. 
But oh my God, every time I suffered, I went to another place of glory. Yes. I was pressed. Now, some people say, well, that's not faith. Yes, it is faith. Because if I didn't have faith, I wouldn't have gotten through the suffering. Hallelujah. Amen. God never said because you have faith, there'd be no mountains. He said you'll be able to move the mountains. Hallelujah. God didn't say because you have faith, you wouldn't go through no sufferings. No, he said you would get through the sufferings. Hallelujah. Faith does not say you won't go through nothing. Faith says it will get you through everything. Hallelujah. Amen. I will overcome them. But in the process of overcoming it, God has created in me a clean heart and renewing a right spirit inside of me. Why? Because I want the manifestation of Christ to flow out of my life. Verse 9 says, Wherefore God also highly exalted him. Now, humility, humbleness, never exalts itself. Humbleness never says, I deserve, I should have, it should be me. Humbleness is always exalted by God. God lifts us in places we could never get ourselves to be lifted into. God graces, graces us in areas we would have never been able to be graced to be. And he graces and he lifts us up and he anoints us and he empowers us, not because of my office, but because of my humility. Many people have the same office of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and God's not lifting them up. Why? Because they're too busy lifting themselves up. And God is saying, don't focus on your office, focus on your humbleness, your humility to be like Christ, to be in his mind, in his servant heart. And if you'll focus on him, he'll manifest through you. Amen. Let this mind be in you. That at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow. Apostle Michael talked about the name of Jesus last night. But let me add something to that. I see a lot of people see the name of Jesus and there's no power. Why? Because their heart's wrong. Because to say the name of Jesus means that I'm going to represent who Jesus is. And Jesus humbled himself. Amen. Had a servant's heart. If the people in our churches would have humility and have a servant's heart, that church will grow not only in maturity, but it will grow in an anointing like you've never seen before that Christ will begin to manifest and just ooze out of every corner of that church. And, you know, we were talking at a round table. I, I was invited to a round table the other day about how we're going to reach the next generation because the next generation really doesn't want to have anything to do with the church. How are we going to reach them when they, they saw so much stuff over the past 30, 40 years and said, I don't want to have anything to do with the kind of church you have. I'm going to tell you how we're going to reach the next generation. We ain't going to reach them. The anointing is going to reach them. The glory is going to reach them. The manifested Christ is going to reach him. So the way I get to reach the next generation is not building up who Eddie Maestas is, but allowing Eddie Maestas to do the same thing that Christ. I had to die to me so that Christ will resurrect in me, hallelujah, and his glory would manifest. And no young person, no child, no demon-possessed person could withstand the glory and the power and the anointing of God that's on on your life. Why? Because it's not you. It's Christ in you. Hallelujah. It's his glory. Look at 
when people in your church start to tell you you're different. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. Because looks at men and women of God, just because you have an office, it doesn't mean you get to act any way you want to act and behave your way any way you want to behave. <laughs> I mean, how do we treat each other? How do we talk to each other? How do we embrace each other? How do we honor each other? Shows a lot of who we are. I mean, Scripture talks about all the time who you allow to sit in the front row and who you allow to sit in the back row. The rich man comes in that has all everything together. Oh, come and sit right here. And the poor man comes in and says, you sit right back there. It shows the condition of the heart of the church. We're more into what people could give us and do for us than what we could do for others. We said we wanted a manifestation of his glory, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Then let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that he humbled himself and became obedient. If we just humble ourselves, now, now, now hear me this, many people humble themselves to what they want to humble themselves to. The hardest place of humbleness is when you have to do something you don't want to do. When you have to connect with somebody you don't want to connect with. Has anybody ever come across that? Lord, I like them, like, like Michael did with me. I like him, you know. I like what he's saying, but, eh. <laughs> it's a good message, hallelujah, amen. Uh, but he humbled himself. And when he humbled himself, I believe there was a whole new grace and anointing that came on his life to be used in ways greater Amen. than he was at that moment. Why? Because he humbled himself. We, we have to humble ourselves to our convictions. We have to humble ourselves to who God wants us to join with. We have to humble ourselves to be in meetings that we may not think is very important, but we need to be there. Most ministers do whatever they want to do. Because they're the leader. But when are we going to be led by our convictions? When are we going to be led by what God is ordering and what God is doing so we can honor him in every part of our life? Why? Because that's where the manifestation of his glory is. The key is Christ said that he humbled himself, became obedient. You really don't become totally obedient without first learning how to become totally humble. Humbleness brings you to obedience. You humble yourself. Obedience in our relationships, obedience in our convictions, obedience to honoring what God tells us to honor, Obedience to aligning to the pattern. Obedience to joining to the part of the corporate body that God tells us to be joined to. Obedience to not focus on, how do I say this in a way where I don't get in trouble because I'm on TV, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> to stop focusing on the title you want because maybe you're not a fivefold. But you want the title so bad that you're willing to go through life and not be in alignment to your purpose when God has something far greater for you to operate and function in, but because you're caught up on everybody's apostles, everybody's prophet, or maybe you're called to be a pastor, but because everybody's talking about being an apostle, I want to be an apostle now. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't, don't you? 
Just stay as a pastor. That's where your grace, that's where you're anointed. Oh, I want to be a prophet now. No, you don't. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, but humbleness says, I don't pick and choose my office or function. Matter of fact, humbleness says, I wait for those around me to recognize the gift that's on me. And I am called of God, but I am commissioned by man, hallelujah, because they recognize the call and the gifting of God on my life. Amen. And then they send me. I never just went. Every went, is that a word? Every went person <laughs> always ends up in trouble. Absolutely. Always ends up in trouble. I know I was one of those went. I was with the Assemblies of God, and uh, I was fired up for Jesus. I was winning souls left and right, bringing people to the house, casting out devils on the streets. God was moving. God was flowing. But something else happened. My head was growing. Has anybody ever seen anybody with a big head? Hallelujah. Exactly. Yeah. And while my ministry was growing, so was my pride. And I was instantly more concerned about my title than I was concerned about God's people. And boy, does God have a way to humble us. And you better, you rather humble yourself than be humbled. <laughs> God loves you enough not to leave you in the condition that you're in. He loves you enough to break those things out of our life so we can be what he has called us to be. And listen to me, God's aligning his church. God's bringing us into our purpose. God's bringing us into our pattern so he can bring us into his power. Hallelujah. Amen. But that ain't going to happen until we get out of this pride stuff and being what we want to be and do what we want to do and go where we want to go and not humble ourselves and be obedient to what God is saying to do. Hallelujah. I always ask people when they say God's calling me to another place I said did God tell you to do that or is that what you want to do well it's just that there's certain people in the church I don't get along with no more I said that doesn't give you a reason to leave matter of fact through that process is where you're going to grow up hallelujah and change because when God puts you with people that cause you to be irritated and frustrated guess what you're with the right people hallelujah amen because God's going to use those people to help you to mature to grow up the most irritating people that have been in my life have caused me to self-reflect and find out why they're irritating me. It's not because there's something wrong in them. It's because there's something wrong in me. That has to change. That has to shift. Is there anybody still here in this house today? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. I like where 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2 says, it says, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, that shall be revealed, that shall be what? And then he tells us, partakers of suffering are also partakers of his glory that will be revealed because it produces humility. Verse 2 says, feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Of a what? Suffering always produces in our life humility. Now, I know we don't like suffering. I don't like suffering. And I've been through a lot of it. But suffering has a way to bring the crushing experience, hallelujah, amen. 
where God begins to produce the greatest anointing out of your life, the greatest oil out of your life, the greatest glory out of your life, because suffering has a way to get rid of us and allow Christ to begin to break through our life so that his glory is being manifested, his glory is flowing through us and not our own self-glory. Romans 8, 18 says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. How many are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God? Hallelujah. How are we going to get there if we're not willing to be humble and obedient? I had a a gentleman not too long ago told me that God called him to be an apostle. And I said, really? I said, uh, who's sending you to be an apostle? God's called me to be an apostle. I don't need man to tell me that I'm an apostle. God's called me to be an apostle. And I said, really? Can you show me that in scripture? Well, God's called. I said, God's called everybody. We're all called. Not just you. We're all called. But you don't pick your office. God gives you the office. And when God gives you the office, you better have the character to walk in it. operate. I said, do me a favor. Before you step out into this being an apostle, give me a year to work with you. And then I'm not going to say I'm going to commission you as possible, but we'll sit down and we'll talk again. But give me a year. Oh, I can't believe you're asking me. I, I got to pray about this. I, I just don't know because I, I'm going to obey God over man. And whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to just do it because man says, I said, just, just give me a year. Let's have, build a relationship. Let's go through some stuff. And after a year, we'll come back and talk again. He goes, oh. you know, I could go somewhere over here and they'll commission me right away. I said, go ahead. Go ahead. And you'll be back talking to me. Matter of fact, I have a guy in my church, he wanted to be a reverend, so what he did is he got on the internet, and they say, reverence license, twenty nine ninety five. hallelujah. So he came to me at church, he goes, guess what? I said, well, he goes, I'm a reverend now. <laughs> I said, why? He goes, I got my reverend license from the internet, hallelujah, and now I'm a reverend. So Jesus. So I said, let me tell you what's missing in your life. Even if you are called in the office of an apostle, you have not learned to be a son yet. And before I'll ever commission anybody to be an apostle, I will first make sure they're a son. And I don't mean son spiritually, like in their identity sonship, but they've been fathered. Matured. Accountable. Responsible. So a year went by, argued through that whole year. We debated, we argued, we talked, we, but he stuck. He stayed because something in him knew this was right, even though he was resisting it and fighting it. A year comes by, he goes, uh, we're having our yearly meeting. Are you going to commission me? I said, no. He says, well, you said a year. I said, I didn't say I commissioned you. I said, we'll talk in a year. He says, are you ready? I said, no. He says, why? I said, uh, I, I don't see it. I just don't. And I'd be lying. And if I commission you and I don't see it and have peace in my spirit, I'm not going to be responsible for that. Oh, but everybody sees it. All the people I talk to, they see it. But you don't. I said, no, I don't. 
I said, let me give you the, the bow and arrow experience. I said, many times you're just looking to see how far you can shoot in your call. But you got to notice that every bow and arrow first has to be pulled back because it's in the pulling back and the stretching and the pulling when you're being stretched, when you're being pressured, when you are being pulled to, you, to the extreme where you can just barely handle it. That's where God produces the quality of the character in your life. So now you can reach the distance and hit the bullseye. But you got to be pulled back. Every leader that I've ever dealt with, I first pull them back. Because then I could tell where their heart really is at. Are they after the title and they're after the position? Or are they really after the maturity, the servant's heart, the humility? So two years went by, and then we were having our talk again. This time he's not asking me to be commissioned. This time he is saying, I don't want to do anything that God's not ready for me to do. He says, it doesn't even matter to me anymore if I'm called an apostle. It doesn't even matter to me anymore if you commissioned to me. I'm doing what God's called me to do. I'm reaching souls. I'm getting people saved. So whether I have that title or not, it doesn't matter. So we're finally getting somewhere. Because <laughs> when you seek a title, you're not seeking Christ. I'll say that again. When you're seeking, any true apostle is not never trying to be an apostle. No. You're seeking him. You're seeking the love of God. You're seeking the heart that is pure, the character that is necessary so you could be the man and the woman of God that God has called you to be. God, help us to walk in our purpose, our assignment. God, help us to get back to your pattern of the way you commission leaders, the way you set them in, the way you grace them and anoint them. And God, let us feel your power one more time. Hallelujah. Amen. Let there be a manifestation of glory where it's not just a one day or one month revival, but it's from glory to glory to glory to glory because the people of God are growing up. And you can always tell when people are growing up, they're coming together in unity. Hallelujah. Amen. They're walking in love with one another. Because the greatest proof of your character is not how well you could preach, but how well you could build relationships with other people. Amen. That you're able to fellowship with one another. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. By the way, I still haven't ordained this person. Not because I don't want to. Because I love him enough. Because I know what it's like to be put into a place of apostle and not be ready. It almost killed me. I almost lost everything. Because when you start to walk in that function, in that office, you better have the character to walk. Amen. When you're being accused, when you're being abandoned, when you're being persecuted, when you're being lied about, when you got to pioneer something, <clears throat> that no one's ever seen before and says it can't happen and you stand all alone and you got to keep pioneering it anyway. Yeah. When everyone leaves you and you're standing there with three or four people after you had a thousand people and you're still pressing forward, you better have the character. You better have the grace of that function 
because of not. Titles will kill you. But if you have the right office, the grace will see you through. The grace not only helps you to operate in the function, but the grace also helps you to grow into the character that is needed to walk it through. Let the anointing fall on the pattern of Christ being the head, the cornerstone, hallelujah, of our faith. And let it come down the father's beards, the fathers that have already been seasoned and matured. And let that maturity that has already been developed in fathers to come down to the garments and the children and the children's children and let it flow to the very person that comes in to Jesus for the very first day that that anointing is flowing to every part hallelujah that the commanded listen to me the commanded blessings of God are falling upon our life Get ready, body of Christ, because we're getting ready to go into a place that the world's going to envy what the church is walking in because we came back to the pattern. Hallelujah. Amen. We came back to our purpose. We come back to our assignments. Hallelujah. And now the glory of the Lord is filling the earth. Why? Because he raised up his ecclesia to cause the church to be accountable to his pattern. Yes. Father, I thank you for your grace, yes. for your mercy that you have shown to each and every one of us that we are able to stand here today. God, teach us to be humble. Teach us out of the hum humbleness of heart that we could walk in total obedience to you. God, remove the spirit of pride from the church, God. The arrogance, the stubbornness, the rebelliousness of leaders, God. That we'll not submit to the convictions of God. Remove it from our lives, God, and help us to align and to join and do not what we want, but what you want. That we will submit ourselves wholeheartedly. For the kingdom is your will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And out of humility and obedience, Father, we stay in the perfect will of God. And in that perfect will is where we rule and reign in dominion and authority as the people of the people of your kingdom. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And give the Lord a good shout of praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Created us a clean heart, God, and renew a right spirit in us, God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. We're going to take a five-minute break. Restroom. There's water in the back. You can bring water in the sanctuary, but you can't bring coffee into the sanctuary. But there's water there in the back. So if you want to take a five-minute break, use the restroom. Uh, go ahead and do that. We'll get ready for the next. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Lord.